I'll be presenting on my master's research, which is on adult sturgeon translocations to reintroduce them into a northern area in Ontario. And I work under the committee of Tom Willens, who is an environmental prof at Trent, Chris Wilson, who is the fish genetics uh, research scientist for the Ministry of Natural Resources, and Tim, Tim Haxton, who is an aquatic biologist at MNR and a local sturgeon expert. So, um, we've entered a period of the six mass extinction, with the difference being this is being driven largely by anthropogenic causes. If we look at the um, vertebrate species populations decline over the past 40 years, it's been 52%. If we further refine this by ecosystem type, we see that freshwater species are even more at risk. And this isn't surprising when we consider um, our heavy re reliance on freshwater ecosystems, which are only 1% of the water in the world and we use for water, agriculture, industry, um, and hydropower development. So um, human development for hydropower and water control is very extensive throughout the globe. Looking at this map, um, highly affected systems by fragmentation and regulation of rivers are in red, uh, moderately are in orange, and unaffected are in green. So there are very few areas that are unaffected, unaffected currently, and they're expected to reduce as we um, reach goals to meet hydropower needs. Um, so the problems with fragmentation um, of freshwater habitat is it can prevent species from accessing areas that are important to um, to carry out important uh, life history, like spawning, uh, and it increases, um, it decreases genetic diversity and um, population size, which increases the probability of having local extinctions and prevents a uh, species' ability to naturally recolonize areas. So this makes human-assisted movement the only way to restore these species in areas where they've disappeared. Um, which brings me to a method to do this, which is translocation, which is the human assisted, a form of reintroduction where humans assist the movement of individuals from one site for release in another, with the goal of reestablishing the species in a formerly occupied area. So reintroductions are a commonly used conservation tool. However, they've focused on uh, mammal and bird species and um, they've had very low success rates historically. Um, so uh, um, we're increasingly faced with situations where a native fish has become uh, locally extinct from part of its range, making uh, human-assisted movement the only way to restore a species to the environment. So for my research, I work with a member of the sturgeon family. Sturgeons have a very unique life history. They are reliant on large freshwater river systems for all their part of their life cycle, making them very susceptible to dam effects. They have slow growth, late maturation. So if you look on the right, uh, the lake sturgeon life cycle, you see that they don't reach sexual <laughs> maturity in between, until between eight and 26 years. So generally 12 years for males, 25 for females. And they are also intermittent spawners, meaning they're not going to reproduce every year. Sometimes it's more like every five years. And they also tend to return to their native spot or natal spawning ground, which are often blocked by dams. So the main threats to sturgeon. Sturgeon are the most um, at-risk uh, families on the globe right now. So of the um, 25 IUCN assessed species, 16 of them are critically endangered, meaning they likely have less than 50 individuals in the, the wild. Um, and the main threat to them historically was over harvest for caviar. Um, and there's also contemporary, um, um, contemporary harvest going on, illegal harvest going on, but they also, the the other main driver of their decline is habitat degradation and change and habitat loss, which are all due to dam effects. So my actual study species is the lake sturgeon, which is a species of sturgeon that completes its whole 
um, so, uh, life cycle in fresh water. It's a listed endangered species in Canada. Um, so it was listed for um, over harvest for meat. Um, however, despite protections, many populations are not recovering, and this is largely due to dam effects. And the recovery strategy for sturgeon suggests restoring populations in areas where they become extirpated, um, making them an ideal candidate for translocation. So my the population I work with is in a 35 kilometer section of river, of the Montagami River between the Wawiatin and Sandy Falls dams. Um, which <laughs> flows through uh, the area of Tunes, Ontario. Um, and they were thought to be extirpated after 40 years with no catches due to overharvest and um, log drives, pollution from log drives. So they mitigated these um, by no, no longer um, having a legal harvest of lake sturgeon in the area and stopping log drives down the river. And in 2002, they um, did an experimental translocation to try to restore the sturgeon in the area where they moved 51 adults from the Adams Creek source population uh, about 300 kilometers upstream to my release site. So the objectives for the study, I have quite a few. Um, first, I'm looking at telemetry data to document post-release uh, and spawning movements. Uh, looking at the demographics of the population, determining, determining if juveniles are present, and looking at the year class contributions, and assessing the genetic diversity of the reintroduced population and comparing it to the source population, and um, looking for relationships between juveniles in the population and translocated adults. Um, so my field sampling consisted of a combination of gear, gear types. So I used extra large gill nets to target adults uh, a sturgeon, a uh, large gill nest to target juvenile sturgeon, and then baited hooks along the bottom to target both. And captured individuals, I took their toe length, fork length, weight, um, and then I externally tagged them with fly tags, internally with pit tags, which are just, uh, you scan over them and it gives you a barcode. And then I took the left pectoral fin for aging and for genetic structure. So essentially, the left pectoral fin is a non-lethal way to age some types of fish. Uh, you age them similarly to a tree. So the light rings are fast growth, which happens in the summer. The dark rings are um, slow growth, which happens in the winter. And then you basically just count the light rings, and you get the age of the sturgeon. Um, unfortunately, because they do slow down growth a lot in later years, you can only age them till they're about 14 accurately, and after that, you have a lot of um, variation. And then a subset of individuals were also implanted with radio telemetry tags in 2002, 2011, and 2013. So these radio tags emit a signal and allow their movement to be tracked. Um, and then um, I tracked them manually from the boat with just an antenna on the front of my boat. I would just drive around and find those sturgeon. And additionally, um, I had stationary monitors at each potential spawning location. So for my telemetry goals, um, I wanted to document the post-release movement and identify the spawning grounds. Um, my third objective is looking at the environmental cues and how they affect spawning movements, but I am still working on that analysis. Um, so monitoring po post-release movement, um, Individuals have, when they are released at a site, they have um, the choice of staying within the release site or moving away from it. And this is general, generally based on the habitat quality at the release site and individual preferences. So to do this, um, when they are first translocated, 13 adults were fitted with radio telemetry markers. Or, um, yeah. And of those 13 individuals, about six of them migrated downstream over the dam, and that's pretty common with sturgeon. They, um, because they have a tendency to return to their natal sites, um, it is generally expected that you're going to lose some, but it's very important for a reintroduction where you already have such a low number of adult or individuals in your population, and you're worried about your genetic diversity and your demographic stochasticity. Um, so yeah, that was unfortunate, but expected. Um, so my second telemetry objective was to identify spawning grounds, which of course 
in order to confirm successful reproduction after a reintroduction is very important, um, and also for the continued protection and monitoring of the individuals. Um, so lake sturgeon tend to uh, reproduce in areas that are um, have clean substrate and fast moving water. This is a very good area for lake sturgeon re reproduction, unfortunately not in my system. Um, but in order to address this question, of course, um, I had the tagged adults and um, stationary monitors at the Wawiatin station, which is just below the dam, and the um, four tributaries that are uh, flow into the river. Um, so we found that they were staging at the Wawiatin station and um, spawning in the spillway, which is just essentially it's where the overflow for the dam comes, but it's the natural river, really. Um, and we were we confirmed that using larval drift netting, and uh, they they were spawning there, and that's kind of expected. Sturgeon tend to migrate as far upstream as they can to the highest natural barrier and spawn beneath it, and dams tend to develop in areas that are the highest natural barrier. Um, so for my demographic goals, so when you reintroduce a population, obviously you want to achieve as low of an extinction rate risk as po possible, but you do have to, um, you have to work with not taking too many from the source population while maximizing your reintroduced population. And small populations are at a higher risk of local extinction due to demographic stochasticity and disequilibrium. So my goals here were to estimate the population size, um, compare my lake sturgeon population to other populations in Ontario, and assess the year class rec recruitment of juvenile sturgeons. So in order to address this question in the 2015 year, I did targeted adult sampling in the spring, targeted juvenile sampling in July, and a stratified depth, or a depth stratified randomized recapture in the fall. Um, and that fall recapture um, followed the protocol of Haxton et al., which allowed me to compare to 28 other lake sturgeon populations. Um, and so this was my population estimate, and it's just the Lincoln-Peterson and a few modified versions of that. So because I was sampling within one year, I can use this um, estimate that has a lot of um, pre prerequisites that you usually can't meet in the natural population. Um, so. Although I have very large confidence intervals because my recapture rate was quite low, um, the bottom confidence interval for all the estimates was actually double the size of the original population. So it's indicating that we do have we are having a lot of growth in this population, which is very positive. Um, so the catch per unit effort comparison. So this is just looking at my population versus 28 other lake sturgeon populations on Ontario. For the extra large mesh, it targets adult sturgeon, so we weren't expecting very many because we only do have our reintroduced individuals. There's no juveniles old enough to be caught by that gear yet. Um, so the extra large mesh was much lower than all other lake sturgeon populations, but um, the large mesh which targeted juveniles was actually on the higher end of other lake sturgeon populations. So it's kind of showing that we are getting quite a bit of recruitment. Um, and if this population starts increasing quite rapidly, it, it really will protect them from um, local, becoming locally extinct again. And so this is the spread for, I ended up aging 115 juvenile sturgeon from the population. Um, it looks as though the first successful reproducing year was in 2006. So the first year they could have reproduced was 2003. Uh, there tends to be delays after reintroductions because um, they tend to put their energy towards uh, exploratory movements and also are quite stressed. Additionally, when working with sturgeon, because there were um, five potential reproduction sites, um, Males actually have a tendency to move around to each site and wait for females, and if no females show up at that site, then they just don't reproduce that year. And then it kind of looks like I have very strong year classes in 2007, 2008, and 2009, but those were just the fish that were 
able to, because I started sampling in 2011, they were able to be caught by the gear for many more consecutive years than the uh, younger fish. And I also, I did take aging samples from fish under 30 cent centimeters. Um, so when you cut off a left pectoral ray, I kind of associate it with like cutting off your thumb. It's, uh, it's not the nicest thing to do to a fish. <laughs> it does grow back, but it's, <laughs> I just, I, I, I didn't have the heart to do it to the little ones because I was worried they might die. <laughs> and my final uh, objectives were genetic objectives. So genetic factors are, are of course extremely important for establishing or establishing populations and avoiding extinction. Um, however, post-release studies of genetic diversity are rarely conducted for reintroduced populations. Um, so we can use molecular markers to actually monitor genetic diversity, look at effective population size, and the reproductive contribution of released individuals. So my first um, objectives for this were to look, compare source and reintroduce population genetic diversity and the effective population size. Um, so in this example, it's just showing, so one of the negative um, negative impacts of having low diversity is that you can have inbreeding. So each of these unaffected carriers are siblings, and if they were to reproduce, and they had their small A being the recessive allele, if it was deleterious, so it caused egg death, then actually they have a one in four chance of their offspring um, dying, having egg mortality, and never um, being contributed to the population. So um, I did a few different classical genetic diversity comparisons. None of them were significant. Um, so this wasn't surprising because with many lake sturgeon populations, even though they're at about 1% of their original abundance, there's no differences in their genetic diversity. And because they, they're such a long-lived species with overlapping laughing generation times, um, it acts as a buffer to genetic diversity loss. And additionally, they are polyploid species, so where we would have one allele from our mom, one allele from our dad, um, they have two alleles from their mom and two alleles from their dad, so they lose diversity a lot slower than a normal um, individual. And for effective population size, this is the size that an ideal pop or size of an ideal population that would lose genetic diversity at the same rate as your source population. So this is, if you're a smaller population, you're gonna lose diversity due to genetic drift faster than a large population. And this actually did have significant results. So uh, the metagamy population had an effective population size much lower than the source population. Um, so the, the infinite source population, that, that does happen a lot with effective population size when you're dealing with a large population. Uh, it's better at actually estimating small effective population size, but um, effective population size is, it's more, it's gonna show more contemporary changes in genetic diversity. So this is actually suggesting that there was a, um, there was genetic diversity loss in the bottleneck of the reintroduction. Um, generally, you want an effective population size of over 100 to uh, prevent um, inbreeding effects and over a thousand to maintain evolutionary potential. So it's looking like they should reintroduce way more individuals into this population. And the number of effective breathers is just the effective population size for a single cohort year. So I just based it on the three years that I had enough uh, juveniles to estimate this. Unfortunately, it's probably still too small of a sample size. As my sample size goes down, my confidence intervals get really, really high, and the last one is much higher than the number of fish that could be reproducing in the population, so uh, probably not a very good um, thing to make conclusions off of, but it just kind of shows that there's more than a few inches. Uh, individuals reproducing every year. And my final analysis, um, so when they reintroduced these adults, they didn't take genetic samples. So I had to go back and try to catch adults. And 
uh, they only externally tag them, and tag, there's usually like 80%, or not 80%, there's usually 80% tag retention, so there's like 20% that have lost their tags from the original move. So I wanted to ensure that individuals that retain tags from the reintroduction were actually related to offspring in the population. Um, so you just do this by, um, I genotyped them at 15 microsatellites and did two analysis. So the service analysis, like the parentage analysis, er, analysis everyone kind of uses, and a colony analysis bases a parentage analysis on sibling relationships. So it's very good for a uh, population that's high re highly related, which is what I have. And basically, it ended up with 76 agreement between the two analyses and um, 10 of the 11 adults that were parents in the population actually had retained tags from the move. So we know that reintroduced adults are. Um, and so for my conclusions, this was a success a successful example of reintroduction. Um, so they do have low genetic diversity. They should move more individuals into this population and in future efforts should move more individuals over time. Um, this study supports the use of wild adult translocations to mitigate dam fragmentation. However, this is a very charismatic species that um, it makes sense to move once you get down to all the populations being fragmented in these situations. It might be much harder to do. Um, and in the face of climate change, translocation case studies such as this will be the basis for informing assisted migration where um, individuals are moved from their native range into areas of climatically suitable conditions. Um, and I have a lot of volunteers and m &R employees that have worked with me over time on this project, so I just want to thank them. above the dam like this. Um, the worry is more so that they're going to become locally extinct because they're going to, their genetics are going to um, decline until they're inbreeding and they're going to have effects that way. But lake sturgeon are kind of, they're like all over North America and they've all remained the same species as even though they're not necessarily like, um, even the Great Lakes, like Lake Ontario, there's 17 spawning sites and they all return to their own spawning site. They don't like intermix breeding and they still are the same species. So I don't think that becoming a subspecies is something that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so for the reintroduction, where was like how big was the source population to begin with and like were there concerns about depleting that population? So the reintroduction. Um, it's actually, if I go back to it, it's Adams Creek, which is like a series of, um, it's like five dams in a row right there. So they have a problem where lake children are being pulled over this dam every year. So they have to go and pull them and bring them up back over the dam every year anyways. So they just took a subset of those individuals and brought them up further. <laughs> so they, it's like, it's horrible. It's like it pulls them over the dam, and then within a day, it completely dewaters. So they all just desiccate and die. So yeah, it's not a it's not a great area to be a lake surgeon there. <laughs> so when you cut the fin off to age them, and it, it grows back, yeah. But then can you use that in the future, like if you recapture it to age them again, or what um, will it look like? Uh, yeah, some Can of my adults I did I did cut them already? for the second time, mm -hmm. but they they were adults, so they already have like a very oh, okay. it, it should grow back in like I would think in a way that would still show it, but um, because they were adult samples, they were already yeah, like so very, anyway. yeah, yeah it's yeah they're it's 
very hard to estimate. Mm -hmm. So if um, the if sturgeon always returns to spawning grounds, yes. um, is there a certain age at which they, because <coughs> I guess that's just it too, that there's, there's the aspect that some of them are already returning because they're not, not wanting to go to that spot. Yeah. But is there an actual age range in which they are, I guess, they're, they can be almost impression, you know, imprinted, I guess, they're imprinted almost to a new environment because I guess that would be helpful to yeah, so um, in the in the states they've started um, rather than reintroducing like adults, they've tried reintroducing juveniles. With the issue being, when you're reintroducing small sturgeon, they have like a one percent success rate, and you have to wait until they reach sexually ma sexual maturity and reproduce to actually quantify if it's going to be like a successful product project or not. But uh, yeah, if there are like hatch in that area or likely return to that area, the nice thing about the sturgeon that stayed being, um, which is my, my other chapter I'm working on, the environmental cues. So as the water starts to warm and get faster, they have a tendency to migrate upstream to a spawning site anyway. So if they have stayed in the area long enough to spawn, they're likely gonna use the spawning location at the release site. Uh, I recall a study, this might be a little bit off topic, but I recall a study that surveyed scientists from all over the world about what they thought would be like humanity's biggest threat. Uh, climate change was number two, and bio, lack of biodiversity was number one. How do you see lakes sturgeon fitting into that biodiversity sphere? Um, it's interesting, because they're, they're kind of, a pretty unique sturgeon in general are very unique fish. There's not a lot of large benthic freshwater fish. Um, so I, I, they're not one of the species that people would be like, oh, if sturgeon are disappearing, like that means there's something wrong with the system. But at the same time, they're kind of, for like, um, I guess they're kind of, an indicator for water quality because they they can't spawn in areas with bad water quality but they're more so these like large fluvial species they really show you what is happening with dams because I don't think a lot of like not a lot of fish are impacted as heavily by dams as fish that are used to having long migratory routes that are kind of um, dependent on flow conditions that have been here for millions of years. Um, so if sturgeon are declining, maybe you're just losing one species, but then all of the other fish like pike and all of the other fish that kind of do the same sort of migratory routes, walleye, like fish that people really care about are also disappearing. started this, and because of your dams, and there's a lot of public people in that area at Sturgeon Falls, so before you started the, the study of the population at that time, so the impact of the public paper before on the sturgeon had already started to impact it. Yeah, so the, they actually, they only reintroduced the, um, the sturgeon because they stopped having the, the pulp go into the river, so that was like the main um, problem for this section was they, the, all the eggs were dying because they'd have like paper on them and there'd be logs going down the river all the time. Mm -hmm. So once they kind of had water quality standards there, they were like, oh, we should bring back this species. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome.